Good afternoon, Rotarians and guests. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Toledo. Today we'll present another great meeting and program with Baker O'Brien. But before we get to that, I'd like to ask Chuck Mann to deliver a reflection and have Marcus Henderson lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I had a minor uh, medical test this morning and was reminded of one of Stephen Wright's quotes, so as I drove home, I looked it up. This is from Stephen Wright. The colder the x-ray table, the more of your body is required to be on it. Uh, I saved this. This was left over from last week. Uh, I decided to save it for later, so <clears throat> it's later. A sailor named uh, Leif Rasmussen returned after several years in the Navy and found during his absence his name had been removed from the town register. He sent his wife to the town hall to make a complaint to the mayor. I'm sorry, said the mayor. I must have taken Leif off my senses. We should probably pray now. <laughs> yes, I thank you. Uh, this is uh, from Vienna Cobb Anderson is the author. It's called Prayer for Artists. Bless the creators who by their gifts make the world a more joyful and beautiful realm. Through their labors, they teach us to see more clearly the truth around us. In their inspiration, they call forth wonder and awe in our own living. In their hope and vision, they remind us that life is holy. Bless all who create in your image, pour your spirit upon them, that their hearts may sing. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Thank you. As we begin our meeting, I'd like to thank and acknowledge Spengler Nathanson PLL, this month's sponsor. We have one visiting Rotarian today, our good friend, the president of the Maumee Rotary Club, Michelle Free. Michelle? Great to have you with us. Now, if anyone has a guest they would like to introduce, I would invite you to come to the floor, Mike, so we can hear you and see your guests. President Dick, fellow Rotarians, I'd like to introduce my two guests today. Uh, I think most of you know them, but uh, Chief of Police, George, Cor uh, George Crawl, as well as uh, Deputy Chief, uh, Jim O'Brien. And if we can, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, Deputy Chief O'Brien. He'll be retiring this Friday after 33 years, so thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Fellow Rotarians, I'd like to introduce Marla Dooner. Marla is the nurse who built the Wildwood uh, Orthopedic Center, and she's a good friend of Baker O'Brien's. Welcome. Nice to have you. President Dick and fellow Rotarians, I know he needs no introduction, but Jim Norman, my guest from the Toledo Opera today. Welcome back, Jim. President Dick, I have with me here Jim Barron. Jim is retired counsel at Owens, Illinois. He mm -hmm. spent uh, many, many years there and working in about 25 countries. And he said to me, you know, I really wanted to get reconnected to Toledo. So here he is. Great. Welcome. Good to see you, Jim. President Dick, my fellow Rotarians, as you all, many of you well know, when you marry the girl, you marry the family as well. Um, and I hit the jackpot. My uh, guests today are my wife's grandparents, who I call my grandparents, Bill and Ruth at the front table. Uh, they're good friends with Baker, and I thought they'd want to come and be a part of the program today. Welcome. Welcome to you all. Great to have you all here. Susan, welcome. Nice to have you here. Now would be a great time to check into social media to let everyone know you're at the Rotary Club of Toledo. 
And after you do that, I would ask you to turn off your cell phones so you can enjoy the rest of the program. I want to invite Brent Kuzno back to the floor, Mike, for an announcement about a new member event. And Shireen Murad also. Yes, yes, there we go. Shireen's here too. So before we announce that great event coming up on August 16th, um, I do want to give you a quick update. Emily was kind enough to let me know that in July we have six new members, and that is tremendous. So thank you all for that. <laughs> at that at that pace, we you know Zach and I and the committee with Shireen and, and Andy. We've set a target of 75, so we're pretty close to that pace. Let's keep it up. We need Excellent. guests are great. They convert to new members. Um, and I'll remember some of you that have been around long enough. I've heard that this club, not that many years ago, maybe it was more than we want to admit, we had over 500 members. So it's not a stretch or reach for us to get there. Um, so thank you for bringing guests. And uh, now Shireen's going to give us just another plug on this great event coming up on August 16th. Please. Hi, everybody. Again, we are doing the H2O Lounge networking party um, during happy hour on August 16th on Thursday from 4 to 7. So please bring anybody that you know that we could possibly be interested in Rotary. We'd love to explain what Rotary is and give a very good explanation of all of our charities that we have and that we do. So please bring a guest, and we'll see you August 16th from 4 to 7. So you may remember back in the days of our good president, past president Riaz, that we had the Rotary After Hours, which were a nice success. And this is sort of bringing that concept back with a great opportunity to, to bring guests and, and have some fun. So four to seven on the 16th. Thanks, Shireen. Thank you both. <clears throat> this time I'd like to invite Foundation Trustee Judy Leb to the podium present Dr. Brent Sleesman, president of Weinbrenner Theological Seminary, with a grant check. On behalf of the Toledo Rotary Club Foundation, it is my pleasure to present a grant check in the amount of $10,000 to Weinbrenner Theological Seminary. The grant provides funding for two pastoral care members, special training in partnership with the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance of Toledo, who will ultimately assist first responders as the individuals that will be called upon to help in crisis or near crisis situations. Our community service committee members received the request, participated in the vetting process, and made the decision to recommend the grant approval to our club board and foundation trustees. This $10,000 grant was recently approved and is made possible through your contributions to our club's foundation. It's your annual donations, your donations made in memory of someone, your monthly credit card donations that are all totaled at the end of the year and make it possible to make these grant awards. In fiscal year 2017-2018, your total donations and your committees who ultimately decide which grants move forward that resulted in total grant funds given of $202,000. Woohoo! So I'd like to invite Dr. Brent Sleesman, president of Weinbrenner, to come to the podium to accept the grant and share a short version of how our foundation's gift of $10,000 is helping their organization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy, on behalf of Weinbrenner and extending to the foundation. Weinbrenner Theological Seminary is located in Findlay, Ohio, but has been serving all of Northwest Ohio for over 75 years. Weinbrenner has chosen to match the Rotary Grant, and that was part of our original pro, uh, proposal for the $10,000 for the specific purpose of training members of the over 60-member Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance, also known as the IMA, 
Toledo inner city faith-based community, and the IMA may be familiar to some of you, it was one of the first groups that Toledo Police Chief Crawl returned to following the events of a few weeks ago. And so it's a core part of Toledo's inner city and Weinbrenner seeking to partner as we transform the community together. The Rotary Club of Toledo's grant combined with our own funds from Weinbrenner will allow us to provide direct pastoral training to two IMA members who will then provide best practice updates to the entire IMA, eventually reaching, and this number is going to sound large, but it's a number we're working with through the IMA, over 20,000 people within this area for community transformation. And additionally, Weinbrenner faculty will provide two annual field relevant training to, again, the 60 plus member IMA organization on topics such as crisis ministry and addiction guidance. And the model being used for administration of this grant is a train the trainer so that we can reach the widest number possible as we seek to work with the Toledo community to transform the community in a way that brings honor to those that are a part of this area. So again, on behalf of Weinbrenner, thank you. Thank you, Judy, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with you in this manner. Thanks. Thank you, Brent. Um, it's, it's nice to have President Michelle from Maumee here today. I don't know if um, any of you saw the article in The Blade on Saturday. It was a great article about the Maumee Rotary Club and the work they've done since 1998 in Guatemala, where they set up a home for abused and disadvantaged uh, girls way back when, and they've made tremendous strides in protecting and educating and, and moving young women along in Guatemala. And it's just a great thing that the Maumee Rotary Club does. And it's another example of the great clubs that are in our area. We've got several wonderful Rotary Clubs, and I urge you to support all of them uh, whenever you have the chance. I also want to give you a polio update that uh, President-elect Tim gave me. There were no new polio cases this past week for the year. There have been only 13, and primarily in Afghanistan. And Tim advises me that this weekend there is a plan to inoculate 10 million people in Afghanistan. So we continue to be ambitious. We continue to be this close to getting rid of polio throughout the world. At this time, I want to invite Executive Director Kathy Tate, who's been extremely busy over the last few days, but she has a couple of updates. Thank you, President Dick. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll be brief today so we can get to our program, but I wanted to mention, if you, in case you missed it, in this week's spoke, well, last Thursday, uh, there was a short little uh, blurb in there. We're planning a trip to Rotary International Headquarters. Uh, if anyone would like to go, let me know. It's in that spoke, but I have a block of rooms. We're going to be there for one day on October 19th. It's a very uh, educational but fun trip. So I have a block of rooms the night before at the Hilton uh, Orrington in Evanston. So just note last week's spoke contained that. Um, out front today, you may or may not have noticed that the new uh, roster for 1819 is available. So pick one up if you didn't already do so. Um, it's the best that we can do with everything that we have in our database. You'll notice some changes. If anything is missing, please let me or, well, me for the next two weeks or Emily know. Just shoot an email if there's a correction to be made. Um, all of the information that's in this roster is pulled from the database. So if it's incorrect, it's just what's in the database. So let us know about that. Um, and last, but one of the most important, hi, Jim. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, one of the fellowship items that's going to return this year, because it was so successful last year, I know bowling is one, but the Euchre Games will return this year. So I just want to give you the dates. Walt, if you could put those up on the screen. Uh, I've got six. It'll start in September. I tried to stick with like the third Friday of every month, but that doesn't always work out. I'm also trying to nail down, um, I think I have the location, but there may be one change Last year we met at Brandywine, but again, things change. Um, but all you have to do is show up. It's at 6 o'clock. You put five bucks in the pot, and then that just pay, pays for the chips and everything. And um, then you just have fun. If you play one Friday, great, and the next one you can't. It's all about the fun. So I hope to see you there. Look for more information about that. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. 
This time I'd like to invite Kevin Mullen to the podium to introduce new member Chad Rutkowski. What do Brad Pitt, Megan Fox, Toledo Mayor Wade Kapsikavich, and our newest Rotarian, Chad Rutkowski, all have in common? Aside, yeah, I will tell. Aside from their stunning good looks, all of them have worked as mascots before making it big. So maybe Chad wasn't inside the costume on a regular basis, but our paths first crossed while Chad was interning with the Toledo Mud Hens. You'll be instantly impressed by his work ethic, intellect, and personality. After the Hens, Chad took his talents to the big leagues as the assistant managing director of the famous San Diego Chicken. Chad has received undergraduate and graduate degrees from Bowling Green State University, Despite that tragedy, Chad was on my short list of talented people I wanted to recruit to the nonprofit sector. Officially on record, go Rockets. I'd say he's doing quite well for the community now that he's finally joined the dark side. Today serves as the Senior Director of Development at United Way of Greater Toledo. In addition to his duties at United Way, Chad is entering his third year as the head varsity volleyball coach at Sylvania Northview High School, as well as a coach at Premier Academy one of the country's oldest and largest volleyball clubs. He has coached hundreds of collegiate volleyball players, some of who have gone to play professionally in both indoor and sand volleyball. Chad lives in Oregon and is a proud graduate of Cardinal Stritch, go Cardinals, where he serves as the chair of the alumni board. Chad and his fiance, Kevin, are getting married this December. Keeping with tradition, Chad's biggest pet peeve is people who say, quote, my bad, Chad says, look, we know you messed up already. No need to announce it to the entire world for us to relive your mistake. He also gets annoyed when people do not act in a way he wants them to or that they should be. Please join me in welcoming to the ninth largest Rotary Club in the world, my friend and colleague, Chad Rutkowski. This time, I'd like to invite Rotarian Yuval Zalyuk to the podium to introduce our presenter, Baker O'Brien. My wife, Susan, our kids, and I arrived in Toledo 38 years ago, almost to the date, actually 8, 8, 80 at 8 p.m. And that was when we encountered the incredible Toledo arts community, and among them, the brilliant Baker O'Brien. President Dick, my fellow Rotarian, it's my pleasure to introduce to you my dear friend Baker, whose work I live with and appreciate daily. Two of her prints are hanging in my office. Baker is uniquely qualified to recount the history of the Studio Glass movement as her mentor was one of its founders. In mid-70s, the Labino Studios uh, studio was um, a sort of glass mecca for newly hatched glass artists, serious academics, and glass collectors of every type from all over the world. Baker likes to joke that some 40 years later, she's on her Antioch College's world's longest work studio co-op, study co-op, but she has had an education like no other. I say she chose well, luckily she's still here, which reminds me somebody else. Her own work is worth paying attention to from blown glass to cast to prints and paintings, the colorful and creative, I feel certain Dominic would have, be, would have been proud of her. Baker O'Brien.
What I do is different than 99% of glass blowing studios or schools. We mix glass from scratch. I'm Baker O'Brien, and I came to the Lubino studio in 1975 as an Antioch College student uh, looking for a co-op job, and I just never left. So what I do is different than 99% of glass blowing studios or schools because they all run colorless glass and they buy their colors in bars and in chippy chunks and powders. But when I add color, it's color that's been made here that's formulated to fit that glass. We mix glass from scratch and add the color right into the glass as it's mixed. It's never the same glass two days in a row. It's always changing in the furnace. And then as it sits in the furnace and it oxidizes, it becomes this dreamy, pale blue, pale green, opalescent glass that we call it ghost glass. It's an honor and a privilege to work with this glass. When I, when I see what other people are, are making and they're, you know, they're so limited with what the colors are, and these colors, are, they're magical. They're just magical. Hi. <laughs> that was a minute and a half. So before I start talking, um, I want I have to thank my better half because she spent a ton of time putting all of, I still call them slides, on a Mac program and then lent me a dress so that I could look like a grown up. So <laughs> thank you, Sherry. <laughs> um, so I uh, have worked with the Bandwork Rotary for, Gary reminded me, 28 years in their fundraising. They buy my glass and then they auction it and they make a lot of money. And it's been 28 years. And last fall he said, Baker, you have to come down and talk to our group because we've got a lot of young members and you've been working with us for so long, they're going to think I'm going to have to help you up to the podium. <laughs> so, no, I, I, I didn't. So. Um, so today, you know, usually when I lecture to the docents, I tell them, I talk fast, I give you a lot of information, I don't want to see anybody glazing over. So the history of the glass studio movement, not all of you are from here, so it's an important, it's a really an important history. Um, back in the early 60s, there was a man who grew up in Corning, New York, his name was Harvey Littleton, his father was Jesse Littleton, who developed Pyrex, and uh, Harvey had went on to become a ceramics professor at Madison, but he had the idea that um, if he could, because all the glass that was being made was all factories. It was like the guys in the pencil ties and the, um, there we go. Um, it was the guys in the pencil ties and the white shirts that did the designs and then took them down to the floor and the, and the factory workers blew all the glass. But Harvey had this wild idea that, you know, if a potter could have a little kiln in the backyard, a glass artist should be able to have a little furnace. So he uh, repeatedly tried to get workshops, you know, to get a workshop. And finally, Otto Whitman, who was then the director of the museum, um, acquiesced and they, put, they parked him as far away from the collection as they could get him in a little garage. And... Um, and they signed people up, and they had a and they had a workshop. The problem was, is that a glass furnace doesn't work like a pottery kiln. And Harvey didn't have an idea how to build a glass furnace. So Nick got the call, who was then the uh, vice president and director of research and development at Johns Manville, and had hundreds of patents on glasses and glass processes. And I will I'm going to do a little aside here. Kevin didn't mention that his grandfather in law sitting here worked with Nick. So that's kind of cool. Um, so anyway, so, uh, so Nick left work and brought everything that they needed to build the little furnace, and, um, and, then, and then he brought the, when they make fiberglass, they make it into marbles first, and then they heat the marbles and they pull fiber. So he brought the marbles, uh, the 475 marbles from Johns Manville, and uh, so they had glass the next day. And, oh, okay, there, there. Um, Nick then really got wind that this was going to be big, and he was really intrigued with the whole idea, a new glass inside and out so that he could do color tests and, um, you know, I mean, he could develop his own glasses and colors. And so he built this building in 1963, I think. You could probably tell by the age of the car, but <laughs> I'm just guessing. But landscaping is everything, <laughs> so it looks a lot different. Um, 
and and it became this whole like it, it became this whole thing that um, you know the studio was like a mecca like like you've all said I mean everybody came I mean and and all the 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 young Turks are now the old guard which is like Jack Schmidt and Fritz Dreisbach and um, uh, you know just everybody Chihuly has been there Pizer has been there and um, and Nick always was uh, generous with the information that they needed um, if, as long as they did their homework. Now, I was an Antioch College student in the early 70s and I was interested in metal work and wanted to do, I really wanted to do wrought iron, um, sort of a la Albert Paley, you know, the gates on the Renwick. And what I found out is that uh, doing doing wrought iron work is really heavy and dirty and I'm much better suited to jewelry. <laughs> so, um, so I was looking for, I, the Antioch has been a, a, a student, uh, you know, it's a work study program forever. And so, you know, after a while you can't, you, you know, they, it's like, bye bye, go do a thing. And um, so I came back to Perrysburg where my parents were and I went down to talk to Otto Whitman and he said, you know, you should talk to the Labinos. He does a little bit of everything. So I talked to the Labinos and start, and Nick said, he said, you're welcome to work here as long as you don't want to start blowing glass. And I said, no problem, I don't care. So I did, I did metal work uh, for the first eight months I was there, commuted back and forth from Perrysburg, and um, they had a big trip to England planned, and so I stayed that fall to take care of everything you know, while they were there. And then I helped Nick with things like, this, is the, uh, this photograph is the icosahedron uh, that's in the Math and Science Building in Bowling Green, and I was helping him assemble that oh, circa probably 1976. And this is just a shot we were building a furnace. So, you know, I learned from the ground up, like, how to do that sort of thing. And um, blowing glass came about because they figured if I uh, could handle the material, I could be of help to Nick at the furnace. And for many years, he would stay seated, and I would um, pick up the piece, go reheat it, and bring it back. I wish I had one of those. <laughs> so, anyway, this is some early work. And then... Um, it's always been all about the colors. I mean, I'm really, um, you know, I really meant that when I said it's a privilege to work with the glass because it really is magical. And um, the, the, the formulations, and I mean, I haven't, I, I tweak with the color, but I don't mess with the basic, the basic thing. So, and then I incorporated glass into jewelry. And um, I have a, uh, I had the opportunity in the early 80s to work for an archaeologist in the uh, in the fall. Um, it was Gladys Weinberg, and it was um, she was a number. She was like one of the top three, and then the other two died. And I guess I guess you're the best glass archaeologist in the world by default. And uh, bless her heart, she had a great sense of humor. But um, I was with her in the museum in ancient Corinth, and she would show she would she, like, point at things that were on display and say, "I dug that, and I dug that, and I dug that." And it was just sort of this like this this new world. And I always think that the time that I spent working with the archaeologists, because um, I worked with George Bass too, who dug the Bronze Age uh, glass wreck, I always thought that that influenced my um, aesthetic with jewelry because I, I like I like jewelry that's you know like timeless. So this is a piece that um, I created for the Jeans and Jim show at the museum in February. It's a sort of a fantasy of a fish. I don't know if you can see the fish in the glass, but um, it's like a little fish fantasy piece, and I had a lot of fun. And this is Sherry's ring. <laughs> and again, I mean, I really favor um, I really favor heavy heritage gold. Um, sorry, <laughs> it's expensive. I know. <laughs> But these are these are these are recent works, and yeah, no more no more um, trip hammers and such. So almost everything that I do in jewelry is custom because I don't make molds and do production. I don't do. People always say, "Do you do art fairs?" I don't do any kind of production, not glass and not jewelry. So everything is everything is individual, and I'm a white elephant. I mean, that just isn't the way of the world anymore. It's all about production. So uh, I was inspired with a trip to France with these lines of little puffy trees everywhere um, on the road. So I did a little series of paintings. I like color. Um, and when I taught at Pilchuck, um, they, they, introduced, they introduced me to um, monotypes, which are glass plate 
paintings. I mean, you make a little painting on a glass plate and then you pull one, you know, it's a print, it's a print process that yields one of a kind work, which usually prints are, you know, it's like an addition of um, a number. But, um, so I was working, when my mom died, I was working on a whole series of, of women, you know, sort of like Ode to Mom series. Uh, and I worked with the Hudson Gallery and um, I was actually like all over Sylvania for a while. That was kind of fun. I was in front of Sauter's. <laughs> my favorite potato salad. <laughs> so, um, and then and then I've worked I've worked um, with designers and I and I welcome more just you know to work with up and coming designers on prints. This was a series I did for um, the Pinnacle. If you uh, when you go to any events at the Pinnacle, I did all those prints. So they're in their hallway. Pinnacle. Yeah, and they're all pointy. They all have a pointy thing. You know, we had a theme. Those Pinnacles. So I was quoted in um, Chemistry Magazine, it's kind of fun, and um, I've got to read it. Um, in its molten state, it's about glass, in its molten state, it is a most fluid and sensuous material, stretching, twisting, and expanding while glowing hot. In its finished state, it has a cold, hard, rigid beauty capable of supporting numerous layers of delicate color and design, but simultaneously extremely fragile. The dichotomy between the two states of glass is a significant part of the attraction. <laughs> so this is um, this is an example of a copper silver glass because um, when I talked in the video briefly about how the glass changes as it sits in the furnace and so I, 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 I sort of go back and forth between the copper and the silver because it, it does, it changes like all the time. Um, this is a clay, this is another way to work in glass where you can get very, perci very precise. Um, and this is a plastic, it's a permaplast clay, so it's oil-based, it never gets hard. Um, and this was a, a horse head that I did, and then it, it looks much more attractive um, in the glass. I like horses. <laughs> so um, this is just a little rundown on how things come, uh, they come to fruition sometimes through um, uh, sketching and then a clay. Um, and then the glass. Not everything is sketched. Some things just are freestyle. So this was a commission for a private residence in Cincinnati, um, and they built it. She built it right into the wall, and then lit it from behind. So I ran into her at a, a mutual friend's mother's funeral. I said, "So how's your tree town?" She said, "Oh, it's great, but everybody that comes in the house says, how's that lit?'" And then I have to go in the kitchen and open the cupboard, move the pasta, and show them the little door. <laughs> So anyway, creative lighting, I, I really appreciate lighting in general, creative lighting. And this was a, I actually designed it as a backsplash, but I haven't had, you know, we haven't actually had it happen yet, but I think it'd be great anybody who has a Florida house that needs a bamboo backsplash. So now we're gonna, we're gonna zip through process. This is a furnace. This is a furnace that's not on. This is an old furnace. This is a furnace that's just been turned on. This is getting a warmer furnace. So the furnace holds at 2100 degrees and it's not like a pottery kiln where it's up and down. With, uh, when, a furnace, when a glass furnace is on, it's on 24 seven and in industry they call it a campaign. So there's, a, there's the full glow of the whole thing. I couldn't bring the furnace here, but you, know, you get to see the little video, so that was cool. Video is much more fun than the stills, really. So the, 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 the glass is gathered, and then the glass is um, blocked, and formed, and reheated, and blown, and puntied up, and then everything that's a vessel has to be puntied, and trimmed, and then opened up, and then goes into the annealing oven. Ah, solid work. So this is sculpting, this isn't blowing. And you can see the tool makes the, the lines. And it's a cat. Cat. I like cats too. So this is a sculpture piece. Um, this is the mold process so that people always, uh, it, it's confusing to people, that they're like, well, doesn't the glass like screw up the clay? No, the glass never touches the clay. The, the glass gets um, to get it gets to touch the mold. So pour the pour it over the clay, 
and then the clay comes away, which I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where that picture went, but anyway, that, so it's, it's like, it's the same as lost wax process. It's, you've got a positive, you take a negative impression of it, and the glass goes in the negative to give you a positive again. You guys are technical enough to get that. So this is another, um, this is another, this is another way to sculpt. Um, that's me protecting myself. Um, this was, this vessel was carved out of styrofoam. This is about two feet long and about mm, 15 inches high. And that was sculpted out of, out of styrofoam first and then covered with wax. So, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't, when it looks like fudge, it just doesn't have the same magic. <laughs> Sometimes people have a hard time envisioning, you know, what it's going to really look like. So these are just some small pieces. And this is what the casting oven looks like when the, when the glass is molten on the top. Sherry snuck this one in. Good. Yeah. <laughs> he knows. She should put it on a loop. Like I could just jump over and over and over. Um, oh, and then that's my goofy horse. One of my goofy horses. So um, I'm, I'm uh, more than happy to answer any questions about processes or colors or whatever you might need to know. Oh, Kathy just asked what punny means. Well, when when a when a pe when a piece of glass is blown, you ha it has to be when it's a when it's a vessel, you have to transfer it off the pipe so that you can open it. See, like the even 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 Libby glass, you know, it's like they 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 pump air into that stuff. So punty pontal, that's a new word. Ooh, I have several questions, but let me just ask the first. What's happened to the icosahedron at Bowling Green? Is it still in good shape, or how is it being? Uh, um, I haven't I haven't visited it lately, but I understand it's still there and it's 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 there. I was head of chemistry there for a long time, so started the Center for Photochemical Sciences, which was in the newspaper today. Not it, but the notion of printing a gun with 3D printing. Uh, have you considered the thought about 3D printing from glass? That, that's all smoke and mirrors to me. Okay. <laughs> there, are, there are about four patents, and I've been discussing this with the museum. Uh, I was just curious if there is any uh, conversation in the community about it's tough go because you have to, uh, you get digital images from, from glass that you don't get from just uh, treating it as a, as a blob that you move around. And so it's got the possibility of uniqueness that it uh, doesn't uh, show its way in, in just, uh, you, you basically uh, can uh, lost wax with glass uh, in, in a way that the 3D printers do. You can with do. the, so with the yeah. soft, soft right. enough yeah. glass, yeah. Anyway, so bottom line is you haven't heard anything about it, right? About 3D printing in glass. I haven't, but I will tell you that um, years ago, one of my favorite bowls that I ever made, um, I dropped a cutting board on it and it cracked. And I have it sitting on a shelf because I'm waiting for the technology where it can be like laser welded. <laughs> well, what you can obviously do with it is scan it and take the scan and then make a, make a mold, for, make a model and a mold from that and go that way. That's doable. Anyway, enough of this. But the bottom line is you've not heard 3D, 3D printing. Thank you. Baker, for the record, my father also worked for Dominic Libido at um, Glass Fibers, and um, I grew up with marbles, a bunch of those little green marbles that we used to play with around there. Do you want some more? <laughs> I'd love to have them, yeah. Um, the color that you talked about, was that something that Libido had done, or is that something that was of your invention, the color in the glass? Um, Nick... 
formulated glass for um, a couple of things. Uh, one is like a really good index of refraction so that it really, it really does sparkle. And the other is a uh, good sound longevity because what was happening back in the 70s is people, it was a sort of a wild west situation with glass formulation. And, and if artists didn't like the way the glass worked, they'd just dump a bunch of soda in it and then the glass would deteriorate. I don't know if you've ever had glass sitting on a shelf that just sort of gets white and we call mm. it chrizzling. New word. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, there are glasses that are not, st and, and, and the, the truth is, is that uh, actually the, the museums have bought glass that have proceeded to deteriorate. So I, I, think, I, think, I think it's a little more regulated now, but what Nick had going for him was a, was a complete and thorough knowledge of the chemistry of glass. And so when he, when he did, especially the reds, now blue is boring. Sherry was always like, do blue, do blue. Oh, it's boring. It's never, it never changes. I mean, I can totally control the blue. I can make it lighter. I can make it greener. I can make it darker. I mean, it's totally controllable. This, the, the, the magic of the copper silver glass uh, is that you can't control it. It's, it's, it's alchemy. It's the phase of the moon. It's, it's heat sensitivity. It's how long it melted at what temperature exactly, and then how long it was worked, and, and what's the temperature of the annealing of it. I mean, it's just you cannot control it. Then I have one other question. As far as a cast glass, do you heat that in the same oven, or is that a different oven than and you pour it, or do you do it the same way as you heating well, it with that, blown glass? The, the the last slide with those uh, molds with the glass piled in there, uh, that's the that's the casting oven. It's a basically sort of a clamshell situation, um, and so you, it has to heat up to 1,400 degrees over a 12-hour period, and then it has to sit at 1,400 degrees for another 12 hours to cook out the molecular water so you don't get a, like a mottled surface. Um, so I can only really cast the glasses that don't have the silver in them because the silver will go into, uh, it'll like re-go into suspension, and then it'll become, um, I like to use the word mucus. It looks like that when you cast that glass. So, so I stick to casting like um, I can cast amber, purple, green, blue, you know, the, the oxidized colors. Do you have any open hours to your studio or store to the public? Um, well, I do. I'm more than happy to entertain visitors. I just like to know when they're coming because I'm not always there and I don't run a retail operation per se. But. Um, I'm, I'm more than happy to have you uh, come visit. All of you, you can all come. You can all come at once. <laughs> uh, well, one of the things Baker didn't mention, but she did amazing commission work for Wildwood Orthopedic Hospital. We requested her to design orthopedic tree, because ortho, tree, all this combined pediatrics. And her work really was amazing. It's still there, it's backlit. Maybe you can mention a few words about that, because it really was so well received. Thank you, Marla. About what? Wildwood. Oh, the Wildwood? Um, it was, it's, it's actually outside, which um, is kind of interesting, and it's the donor wall. Is it the donor wall? It's like a little garden. Yes. Yeah, it's like a little patio garden where people can go. I'm assuming they can't smoke there, but... Um, so, uh, so yeah, and, and it, they were built right into the wall. It was it was really nice, and yeah, I would I need a professional photograph of that. Let's work on that. Thank you, Baker. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Baker, for that great program to show our appreciation. The Toledo Rotary Club Foundation. It's going to make a donation to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund in your honor. And we also want to present you with this uh, book, Historical Tales of Toledo. Thank you very Almost. much. You're very welcome. Thanks again. Please join us next week when our speaker will be Randy Cole from the Ohio Turnpike Commission. The Disability Service Committee and the Peace Strategies meetings will be after today's program in the North Cape and Presque Isle rooms, respectively. Uh, welcome again. Chad, it's great to have you with us. Kevin, thank you for bringing Chad in. We appreciate it very much. And Chuck, I hate to tempt you. You almost got time for a monologue, but I don't want you to be too ambitious here. What? 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 I, I wasn't, I didn't ask it during the normal questioning uh, questions, time for questions, but 
when you have that oven and it's at 2,000 degrees and it's time for lunch, have you ever had anyone bring in a pizza paddle and a pizza and <laughs> cook it in? It's hot, hot enough to do that. It would melt the paddle. It would melt the paddle. <laughs> okay, probably not a good idea. A few more quotes from Stephen Wright. Borrow money from pessimists. They don't expect to get it back. <laughs> Half the people you know are below average. Um, can, I, can I do that one? Yes. 99% of lawyers give the rest a bad name. He said I could do it. He said I could. Uh, and 82.7% of, of all statistics are made up on the spot. Lucille Desiree Ball was born on this date in 1911. On October 15, 1951, I Love Lucy made its television debut cementing Lucille Ball's status as one of America's top comedic actresses and pioneering a new sitcom genre that would influence countless family-related sitcoms for years to come. During, during its six-year run, I Love Lucy's success was unrivaled. For four of its seasons, the sitcom was the number one show in the country, earning Ball four Emmy Awards. In 1962, she became the first woman to own a major television studio after buying her former husband, Desi Arnaz, out of their television production company, Desilu Productions. Desilu Productions Studios produced television hits like Our Miss Brooks, Make Room for Daddy, starting to, starring Toledo's own Danny Thomas, and The Dick Van Dyke Show. Desilu Studios also produced three shows that would be made into major motion pictures, The Untouchables, a groundbreaking sci-fi show called Star Trek, and an, obscure, and an obscure series about a team of government agents called Mission Impossible. The, for the, by the way, the box office total for the first five Mission Impossible films, not including Fallout, which is, which is showing now, is $2.9 billion. So we celebrate Lucille Ball with her own inspiring words. Here's a quote that reminds us why we love Lucy. The secret of staying young is to live honestly, eat slowly, and lie about your age. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Well, that's it for today. Um, remember to be servants out there so we can be the inspiration. We are adjourned. <laughs>